Hi everyone, welcome to today's webinar, Adapting Your Freight to the Coronavirus Reality. Thanks so much for joining us. We know that this is a stressful time trying to figure out what's going on with your shipment um, during all this uncertainty. So we hope that we can help you out, make it a little clearer, a little more straightforward and help you figure out how to manage your shipments. My name is Devora. I'm on the marketing team here at Freydos. And for anyone who doesn't know, Freydos is the world's largest online freight marketplace. We help thousands of importers like you compare, book, and manage freight across over 75 providers. We help you navigate pricing with real visibility into the current market, manage all of your shipments and billing on one platform, and we round that out with some great technology and human support. If you haven't already, you can sign up for free at Fredos.com. So today we have three parts to our agenda. The first is understanding the effects of the coronavirus so far on shipping, what's been happening. Um, second, we're going to get into how recovery is going and how it's expected to continue in the next weeks and months. And third, we're going to get practical and we're going to help you make a plan to manage your shipments right now with some practical tips and advice. Our presenter today is Tal Kohn. He's a business analyst here at Fredos. Tal provides market pricing trend insights, um, which means that basically he's our pricing expert and the person that we really want to hear from today. Um, he also really loves the Chicago Cubs, which is very important. So here is Tal. Thank you, Devara, for the introduction. Uh, as Devora said, we're going to be taking a look at what has been, what is now, and what we expect to, will be with regards to uh, everything having to do with the coronavirus. Uh, as we probably all know by now, the coronavirus is a flu-like virus, which was first contracted from animals, uh, seemingly in the city of Wuhan, which is in the Hubei province in the middle of China. Um, the, it spread very, very quickly, and unfortunately, uh, just to take a moment uh, for the personal side and the, you know, the human side of things, uh, 2,700 people um, have died until now. Over 81,000 have been infected. The death rate increased from at the beginning somewhere around 1.5% to now 3.5%. Uh, tragic situation, very frightening by how quickly it's spreading. I hope that everyone uh, stays safe and healthy. Uh, and our hearts and thoughts go out to uh, those who have been affected uh, by the disease. Um, we're here, obviously, not to talk about that, but to talk about uh, freight and how uh, the coronavirus has impacted business. So we'll transition to that. Um, you know, coronavirus was kind of detected and uh, started to spread at the same time as Chinese New Year, which uh, came out at the end of January, beginning of February this year. Um, really terrible time because everyone was traveling around going home for Chinese New Year to be with their families and so the virus spread very rapidly throughout all of China. Uh, as you can see the, the more populated parts of China on the east and the center um, all affected uh, over to the west and the less uh, densely populated areas not as much. Um, but it uh, the, the timing caused a couple of problems for, in terms of business. Uh, number one, in, 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 general, in general, when you have Chinese New Year, everyone goes home, factories shut down, basically the entire country shuts down for one or two weeks, and then everyone comes back to business and there's all this work, all this production to catch up on. So before this shutdown, everyone's trying to ship goods out, prices go very high, there's limited space. And immediately after, as everyone's trying to catch up from what, from their own vacation, also rates stay high for another week, maybe two weeks, uh, and then they come back and start dropping going into June. But the coronavirus, because of the timing, it is in essence extended Chinese New Year for almost an entire month. So all the backup that we usually have around Chinese New Year is going to be much more, uh, the effects of it is going to be much more severe. Um, and we're going to see that everything in the supply chain uh, is is really much more impacted than normal. Wait, Tal, you said that normally it extends until June. Or is that 
So oh, normally okay. the rates start to decrease about a week or two weeks after uh, Chinese New Year, mm -hmm. and they keep decreasing until oh, I see. June okay. or so. This year we're probably going to see something completely different uh, since all the timing is off and there's going to be all this catch up. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I wasn't clear about that. Before. That's fine. Um, okay, so you know, practically speaking, um, if you're producing toys, skateboards, whatever it is. All of that has been shut, to, you know, hasn't been happening uh, for much longer than usual. Um, and it's gotten to be so bad, there's such a backup that, th think about this. You're working with a factory, right? That factory probably has a whole bunch of other customers. Let's just say 10, for example. The factory usually thinks to itself, okay, I've got Chinese New Year coming. I'd better make sure I have raw materials to go and catch up for these 10 customers, uh, you know, backlog for a week or two when we come back. Well, now the coronavirus has hit and we're talking about a month of backlog. So whatever kind of supply in terms of raw materials that your factory had in place isn't going to be enough. And they're going to need to bring in more raw goods from either other factories in China or from outside of the country. And the problem is they're now going to have to wait for those country for those factories in China to produce their own goods and send them out to them. Or if goods have to be imported, well, nothing's getting in and out of China right now. And there's, we're, as we're going to discuss a little bit more in depth later, there, there's a big shutdown in terms of air freight uh, coming into and out of China. So getting goods to your factory so that they can produce the final product is also um, – not happening or not at the rate that it should. So things are going very much delayed. Um, in terms of ocean freight, whatever, you know, there, there's nothing going out. We had a case that we read about about a week and a half ago of a 23,000 container vessel, you know, a vessel that should be carrying on it 23,000 containers. It departed China, uh, you know, after. Uh, you know, the some of the restrictions um, uh, were lifted and some boats did start to, to ship. Only 2,000 containers out of 20, a possible capacity of 23,000 actually went on this vessel. That doesn't seem right. Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it, it's you can see, I mean, that just tells That's you how crazy. serious, yeah, how yeah. extreme the situation there is. And carriers are losing tons of money. Everybody's losing money from this, but especially carriers, which may affect their behavior later when things come back and pricing. But we're going to have a whole a whole slide about um, how ocean freight's going to is starting to recover and reacting. But this is kind of where we're starting from. Uh, so you know, this is what's been happening until now. Uh, there is a little bit of good news in that this week there's a lot more progress towards. China recovering, or at least trying to get things back to normal, but definitely still not uh, all the way there. Uh, as you can see from this map, officially, you know, again, the west side of uh, China was back to work more or less after Chinese New Year, February 3rd. Uh, but as you go to the more populated areas to the east and the center, you're seeing February 10th was the official return to work day, sitting smack dab in the middle there. Um, not quite a little off to the right, you see Hubei uh, in that orange, where uh, initially they were going to be coming back later, and now we're talking about them being authorized to return to work on March 11th. So, you know, the, the epicenter of all of this still very much affected and not back to work at this point. Uh, but even though there was official clearance from the Chinese government to resume work as of February 10th, we saw that until this week, people were for sure not physically going back to uh, to work. Maybe they were working remotely, maybe not working at all, uh, because there were still restrictions on inter-province traffic and movement. Uh, all sorts of health checks and having to quarantine yourself if you go between provinces. So it's nice that there was this official announcement, February 10, we're back to work, but it didn't really happen. Mm -hmm. This week, however... Um, things seem to be getting much better. The restrictions are being lifted. People are going back to work. Uh, we're seeing and hearing reports that 50 to 70 percent or so, different you know, different numbers from different sources, but somewhere in that area of people are physically back to work. So that uh, obviously you know directly impacts on production and factory labor. 
Um, like we said, Hubei is still closed till March 11, but um, for next week, the beginning of March, we're talking about the, or we're, we're seeing predictions of about 80% of people, uh, again, being physically back to work. Um, so let's talk a little bit uh, more deeply about what's going on with factories. As we said, 70 to 80% of factories are open doesn't necessarily mean that the full workforce is back. And uh, as some background, what's been happening that's caused the delay in factories coming back online is that when the coronavirus spread, the Chinese government said, okay, look, we have the world's, you know, one of the world's largest economies here and we can't keep it shut down forever. We need to figure out a way to enable people to get back to work. So they said factories have to apply or have to submit um, a plan for how they're going to bring their workers back while also preventing the spread of the coronavirus. So, you know, you need to have everybody wear surgical masks and, you, you know, sanitizer every five feet. You know, I, I'm probably exaggerating here, but to, to give you a sense of the kind of uh, preparation that has to be done, these plans had to be devised, submitted, and uh, approved, and then actually implemented. So we're talking about a country of over a billion people all together trying as quickly as possible to come up with these plans, flood whatever official channels there were for getting approval to open up again, and then make sure that they have the materials that they need to ensure safety and prevent the spread of coronavirus. Now, that isn't necessarily all at hand, and as we discussed before, air, and, and we'll get again, we'll talk a little bit more uh, on this in just a moment. But airlines have not been flying into and out of uh, China because they don't want the uh, they don't want the the coronavirus to spread, and governments outside of China don't want uh, the coronavirus to to spread. So you can't get stuff in quickly. And what, what do you have to, what, how do you get goods into China right now? Or what was the case, uh, let's say, as of last week? If you needed things quickly, you have to fly them into South Korea, unload them from uh, you know, the airplanes, pack them into containers, and sail them from South Korea or whatever other Southeast Asian country uh, into China that way. So... Instead of a quick air freight shipment to bring in your you know, your surgical masks and your hand sanitizer very quickly so that China can get working again, there's additional delay because you can't do a direct routing with an airline. So the air freight situation um, is directly affecting the factory situation. Yes. Okay. Everything is uh, is is all intertangled mm -hmm. and. Uh, like you said, we're talking about even the very first stage of actually just factories getting back on. Forget after the production and getting stuff back out to the world, uh, which inf impacts most of the uh, you know the listeners here. Um, but <laughs> we're talking about just even before that, how do how do we get how does uh, China come back online? Um, okay, so you know it's it's been a long process. Um, and even though we said that 70 to 80 percent of the factories are open, not necessarily not everyone's necessarily back to work yet. So uh, you have to kind of you know consider that when you look at the number of the factories that are open. Um, right. So air freight, like we said, airlines have basically stopped flying into and out of China. Some have announced that they're not going to be flying for months. And even though um, cargo airplanes, you know, airplanes that are dedicated exclusively to cargo, are flying in and out with a higher frequency. A substantial amount of air freight goes on passenger planes. And so when the whole industry shuts down and stops flying uh, passenger planes, that's going to uh, affect the flow of goods by air freight. And when you don't have air freight, you don't, you're, you're obviously talking about slower shipping. Um, so, you know, just one last point there on the air freight is if, if you're thinking about once in fact your factory is back on, if you need to rush goods out to, uh, to wherever, you know, you're shipping them to air freight may not be an immediate option or it, it will, could be an extremely costly option uh, at this time. 
um, ocean freight. So it's really an interesting story of what's going on here. So there's no production, which means there's nothing to ship out. Okay, if there's nothing to ship out, you have these 23,000 container vessels only carrying 2,000 containers, and the carriers are saying, this is crazy, why should we bother posting sailings? Let's just cancel all of these shipments. Um, and, you know, that, that's been done, and uh, we'll, we'll get into it, it's poten the potential effects of that um, once China does come back fully online. But carriers have, have been canceling um, sailings and trying to lower rates in order to grab up whatever capacity is there. You know, better to ship 3,000 containers at least than 2,000. But at the same time, if there's nothing to ship anyway, it doesn't really help. How much, it doesn't matter how much I lower the rates as a carrier because nobody's shipping, nobody's shipping. There's nothing to ship. Um, so we have seen that the rates have gone down a little bit since Chinese New Year, about $75 to $100 trans-Pacific to the U.S. and Canada. But at the same time, you know, carriers really aren't incentivized to slash the rates uh, any further. Uh, now, once production starts, sorry, even just a second before I move on to once things come back, uh, another point is that because people have not been able, people in China have not been able to move uh, back to work physically uh, at the ports. You know, you have only a few sailings, but there's there aren't even enough, enough people at the ports to operate those sailings and move the containers on and off. Uh, so this is causing even delays on these few containers that are shipping out. There are delays in the the vessels being ready and, and going. An overarching theme in all of this is delays, 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 <laughs> and uh, the port labor is has, is certainly a, a part of it. Um, now, in the middle of all of this is trucking. You know, it's it's fine and good if you have fifty percent of your workers back uh, in the in the factories producing goods, but somehow those goods have to go from the from the factory to the port, and that's obviously through trucking. And with trucking, the situation's a little bit uh, slower. So what, from what we're reading, truckers are back only more like 20 to 30%. And because there's a lack of supply there, trucking rates are up by 30% or so um, in, you know, in response to the, the fact that the truckers have not returned. Um, so one of the impact. So the big issue here seems to be the fact that uh, there are restrictions still between on traveling between provinces. So as long as that's going on, you can produce your goods in one province, and you might want to ship out of another, but you're not going to be able to. You know, we'll see how quickly that ban is lifted. But for now, that's messing things up with the trucking situation as well. Uh, one of the kind of maybe overlooked impacts of this potentially um, when you're thinking about shipping, producing your goods and getting them to port is that if your factory produces goods and can't get them out the door, either your factory is going to be aware of the situation and say, you know what, I don't want to produce your goods yet because I'm not going to be able to ship them. So why are we bothering? And that's going to cause delays in your production or they'll produce the goods and then they won't have any way to get them out, and they'll start char charging you for storage uh, if it's really taking a very long time to get a trucker. What you're going to want to do is make sure that this doesn't become a problem for you. So communicate with your supplier, make sure that your supplier is organized, and that you've kind of had this discussion ahead of time to to um, to curtail or you know head off any any issues. Um, anyway, the trucking is really going to determine how fast demand picks up in terms of ocean freight. Um, if, we are, if we're saying that maybe tomorrow everybody comes back to the factories, but there are still no truckers to deliver goods, then there's not going to be, there's still not going to be a flow of containers to ports and vessels are still not going to fill up or there's not going to be tons and tons of demand for whatever space there is on the available vessels. So even if production kicks back up immediately, if there's no way inland to transport goods to the ports, ocean freight rates might not uh, recover or start being affected 
uh, immediately. So trucking is very is really a very critical cog in all of this. Okay, um, now that we understand what uh, is and what has been, what can we expect going into the future? Um, number one, I hate to say it, but <laughs> delays. Yeah. Um, everything we've discussed from the trucking situation to the slow return to work to the questions about whether there will be carrier space to the fact that there is not much of a good freight air freight option, like everything is saying there are going to be lots and lots of delays. Um, just an additional point here about the carrier space, you know, if the carriers, as we said earlier, have been saying, well, I don't want to ship, I, I don't want to have sailings that are completely empty shipping, there's no point, let me just cancel the sailings. What happens if all of a sudden truckers are back, factory workers are back, and there's lots and lots of demand, all these containers moving to the ports, but the carriers have said, hey, well, wait a minute, <laughs> I canceled all my sailings. I only have five boats that I'm uh, that are leaving this week instead of ten or fifteen. Everybody's going to go bit on, on a bidding war for whatever space there is, and uh, you know rates. There's going to be delays. First of all, again, you might say, okay, I, I want a booking, but there's nothing available for the next two or three weeks or four whatever it might be, or maybe you get a booking and then a carrier rolls your, your shipment. It's, it's going to take time. Sounds like on the one hand, you know, everybody coming back to work in a burst could be a very good thing for, for production, for getting things moving. On the other hand, like the bidding war that you mentioned could make things very tight, very expensive, um, and still, and still delayed. Right. That, that is a, a great way of summarizing it. Yes. Um, exactly what you said. Absolutely. Uh, and by the way, that's without even mentioning that at the destination side, let's say you're importing to um, you know the port of New York, so you have a whole bunch of vessels all leaving at the same time with all these goods and all coming into New York at the same time. There are going to be delays in New York too, and then truckers trying to pick up the goods in New York. Like it's. It, it, the, the delay is going to come in a wave. It's going to start with the production, and then it's going to affect the sailing out, then it's going to set. It's just, yeah. <laughs> okay, well, maybe there are some things that, that people can do um, to try to manage. Did you want to add anything before we get into the tips? No, we, we can move on to that. Okay. Um, yeah, so if you want to try to, to manage this well, uh, first of all, communicate. Communicate, communicate, and once you've done that, communicate again. Uh, talk to your supplier. Make sure you really know when your goods are going to be ready. Uh, confirm that there won't be any delays. You know, maybe your, your production cycle takes a week, and they say, okay, yes, we're going to start working on it. Just make sure when it's close to the goods actually being ready that they have there haven't been any uh, unexpected delays. Um, be close, be close in touch with your forwarder as well. Make sure that they're always on top of the next step of your shipment to make sure that there are no uh, additional unnecessary delays, whether that's arranging the trucking well in advance, making sure that customs clearance when you're importing is done as soon as possible, whatever it is, talk to your forwarder. Uh, you can even talk to your forwarder about, you know, these port congestion charges that I said, you know, the example of the New York. Um, they'll know which ports are up and running in China. Maybe there are some alternate routings that wouldn't be uh, sensible in, in general, but because of the circumstances, you can get your goods out quicker if uh, you pay a little more and go some other routing. Um, you know, work work very closely uh, with your forwarder and be uh, as much as we don't like to have to manage our freight. If everything comes back at the same time, your forwarder is probably going to be crazy, crazy busy once uh, you know from all of their customers. Um, and you'll want to be maybe a little bit more careful and on top of your shipments this time uh, than in general and remind your forwarders uh, to watch out for things. And just to, just to clarify for everyone, you can speak to your forwarder now, right? That's all online at this point. Yeah, yeah, for okay. sure. No, speak to your forwarder now. There's no reason that you shouldn't uh, start having these conversations. You don't have to wait for um, goods to be ready. You can plan and consult with your forwarders, obviously, until you have goods that are being produced. Um, there's not necessarily too much practical to talk about, but at least to understand what are the possibilities and get that brainstorming uh, going, uh, you can definitely do that now. Uh, the second thing, if you happen to have goods ready now, 
try to get them out now while the rates are a little bit depressed and the carriers are kind of desperate for, you know, and open to take anything. Because if you wait, let's say, you know, the end of March or beginning of April from everything that we're reading and seeing, the expectation is that production is going to come back. April, things could, in the end of March are when space is going to be extremely tight and rates are going to start going very, very high. Would you say that for all types of modes? Um, well, air freight is going to be uh, its own animal. Or, you know, we're going to have to see what kind of capacity there is, how quickly airlines are willing to come back mm-hmm. uh, online. Certainly, this will be the case for ocean freight. Uh, also, we'll have to see if carriers are going to try to maybe recoup some of their losses from February yeah. by continuing to have to provide very limited sailings mm-hmm. uh, initially, so that they can jack up the prices and try to you know recover a little bit. Um, it's definitely going to affect ocean air freight, whatever space there is, uh, is going to be in very high demand. So yeah, to, in, to succinctly answer your question, it will probably affect every mode. Um, one other thing that you might want to explore with your forwarder and have a little bit more of a conversation about is if you can handle it in terms of your inventory, you might want to ship out smaller shipments now, not full containers, but maybe to some LCL shipments. Why would this be something to consider at this time? So number one, LCL pricing tends to be very stable. Even in times when FCL prices are volatile, LCL prices aren't as affected. That's its own a separate conversation. Um, but you can, you can lock in some stability there. And also, when you ship LCL, uh, you're really piggybacking on FCL capacity of the, the co-loaders who are consolidating your LCL shipments into their containers. And what the co-loaders do is they buy massive, massive amounts of space from the carriers. So whereas you, as a small business, may want to send a container and then the carrier will say, well, I'm sorry, I'm rolling your container to the next sailing or two sailings on. They're not going to do that to a co-loader. Um, so if you send a small, an LCL shipment, you go on the co-loader's container, there, it's a higher likelihood that it's going to get out on time. So discuss that with your forwarder, do, crunch your numbers, see if that makes sense. Um, and it's probably not um, practical for many of the listeners, but if there's anyone out there who can wait it out a bit um, till May, June, uh, and try to avoid this altogether, um, that really is probably the the best strategy uh, in this situation. Um, Okay, so I hope that this has been helpful information for you. Um, Remember all the tips here, especially the communication. It's going to be a tough time, so prepare yourself uh, and make sure that you follow all the updates online and at freightoffs.com, and uh, good luck. (laughs) Um, Unfortunately, it's not... As, as good news as we would hope, but um, thanks, Tal, for, for laying that all out for us and for, and for providing some, some practical ways to move forward in, in the midst of all this uncertainty. Tal, how much are we actually looking at rates increasing because of all of this? Yeah, so, uh, <laughs> yeah, what, like, like we've been saying, every step of the process here. So we have a few um, questions. First of all, Tal, so we have a few questions. Actually, so first of all, Tal, how much are we actually looking at rates increasing? Um, and maybe a typical move would be $400. So up another 30% is another $100 or so. Uh, in the worst case scenario where everybody comes back, truckers come back, production's back, everything happens at the same time. But the... Uh, carriers haven't added so many um, ships yet that are sailing, and they are trying to, you know, price gouge a little bit to recover some of their losses. You know, maybe four or five hundred dollars per container, even an increase, I don't think would be unrealistic. If you get hit with congestion charges at the destination, those can be a hundred fifty dollars a pop. Uh, you know, hopefully it's not it's not going to be this bad. But worst case scenario, you might be looking at fifty uh, percent extra to ship at this time, which is again why uh, exploring other options, LCL or holding off, might be the the best uh, the best uh, option that you can go for. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how other countries might be affected? 
Yeah, so I mean, South Korea is having more of the coronavirus cases recently, but I'm not aware of uh, them quarantining, at least certainly not at the scale that China did. Mm-hmm. Um, that might just be because it's not reported in the media as much as China, since China is so much more significant. But we, um, on our on the Fredos.com online marketplace, have been seeing people continuing to ship and ask for uh, quote requests outside of China and in other places in Southeast Asia. So it seems that whether we're talking about direct sailings that bypass China um, or other kinds of ways of avoiding this whole issue, it seems like Southeast China, uh, Southeast Asia is uh, far less affected and that things are more or less normal there. Okay, okay great. So let's say you know somebody's ready to book their shipment now. Um, is there any point to doing that? Is, is everything going to change in the coming weeks and months? Uh, yeah, so again, everything we've discussed about delays and uh, price uncertainty has to be kept in mind. But at the same time, uh, the later, like I said, if you have things that are ready sooner, um, you should book now to try to take advantage of the period when the rates are still a little lower. Um, you also want to try to get your foot in the door and get your forwarder trying to book space earlier. So in the case, in the event that you your containers are rolled or that you have delays, at least you've started from an early point. And it's not like you're joining the game late and, sorry, there's nothing for a full month. Try to get your foot in the door uh, sooner. Expect there to be changes, but there is an advantage, at least to just kind of, you know, RSVPing or, you know, calling the restaurant and having a reservation. Yeah, it's like getting uh, on a waiting list now, actually. Right? Yeah, 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 waiting list. That, that's really the best analogy. Um, but, so you don't want to be down at the bottom of that waiting list. You want to get in now. Um, again, expect things to change. Don't be surprised. Prepare yourself for that. But do, do put yourself on the waiting list. Okay. Thank you so much, Tal. We're so happy that you could join us um, today and, and share expertise about this really difficult time. Um, Yeah, thank you so much. Pleasure. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today for our webinar. We really appreciate you taking the time, and we hope that you found it useful. Um, Just to echo what Tal said, it's not too early to get started. So if you are ready to search for a shipment or book a shipment, head over to fredos.com. And if you'd like to reach out, you can email ship at fredos.com with any questions or concerns, um, and we'll be happy to help you out. So we're hoping for good news soon, both about containing coronavirus and about getting your shipments back on track. So thanks again for joining us. Have a great day, everyone.